OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Eugene, for the talk. I, for one, learned quite a few interesting bits about Kotlin. And um, yeah, welcome to State of Kotlin on Android. So um, this has been a while since I was doing a, a keynote talk like, uh, talk like this. So I decided to go a little bit light on technical details, although I hope you'll find a few things that you didn't know about, and rather talk a little bit about how we got here, a little bit of history, how we introduced the language on Android, and so on. Oh, and fun fact, uh, it's actually the second time I'm, tra um, I'm in Budapest for a conference. Uh, the only problem was the last one was in Krakow, and the flight landed here. So I <laughs> did have a little bit of a problem. Uh, so uh, this time is a little bit better for me. <laughs> all right, so um, let's start. Well, as you know, well, first of all, how many of you are Android developers? I know this is not only an Android conference. Uh, about half. That's, that's good. That's good. Um, so as you probably know, um, Kotlin has been around for a long time now. But for us on Android, for Android developers, um, some of you started using it before 2017. But for me, for my team, for Google, we only announced that we support um, Kotlin on Android uh, officially in 2017. It was May. It was Google I.O. It was one of the um, most well-received uh, announcements at the keynote. I think everyone, everyone really wanted this to happen. Nobody was expecting us to do it. And it wasn't easy getting there. Um, and you know, it wasn't uh, even easy just announcing it like that, and then we're done. Now, go and use Kotlin. It's, it's done. Uh, we're, it's supported. There was a lot more behind it. And so it was a process. It was a process that began before um, I.O. It was a, it's a process that's going on even now. And to put it into perspective, you know, uh, this is how it really looked. When the Android SDK first came out um, over 10 years ago, it supported the Java programming language only. Um, then it took a while, a year, uh, until we allowed other languages on the platform. So native development with C and C++, uh, basically anything that you can compile into native libraries. And then all these years passed until we finally decided that it's time to add a new, a third language to the platform. And so Kotlin um, joined Java programming language and C and C++ as the officially supported language. And this decision didn't come lightly. You know, it wasn't an e um, easy decision to make. Like, once you add a language, you have to support it forever. It's a commitment. And um, also, you know, we can pick something that's not really native to the platform, that doesn't fit with how the platform works. And fortunately for us, Kotlin was not only really liked by the community, it's also you know, greatly interoperable with Java. So we never told you that now we're switching to Kotlin, now you have to re rewrite all your apps. Um, none of the Java libraries will work. No, um, I think this was the big part of Kotlin's success on Android and on other platforms as well, on, on the JVM, on server. Um, and so people started slowly using Kotlin, right? So going back to the initial slide, you know, what happened in the two years from 2017 up until 2019, just um, last month, when we announced that Kotlin, um, that Android is now going Kotlin first, and what that really means? So in this talk, I want to talk a little bit about what we were doing for the past two years, and then um, really explain what Kotlin first is really about, and look a little bit into the future of how Android app development will look uh, post this announcement at I.O. So you know, when we first announced this uh, two years ago, what did it really mean that we are officially supporting Kotlin? Well, it all, all starts with the IDE, with the tooling, right? You have to have the tools available to you to be able to use Kotlin on the platform and not be afraid that something breaks. And so the first thing that we did, we did it was a promise. We're not going to break Kotlin. In fact, we're actually going to bundle it with Android Studio. And some time passed, and we, of course, broke the promise. Uh, mostly in beta and canary versions, the Kotlin plugin sometimes, you know, if you upgraded it to a new, new version, it wasn't compatible with some of the changes that we made in Studio. These were early times when we were still kind of figuring it out. Um, but I'm happy to say that, you know, working with JetBrains has been amazing. And um, we have our internal tools from Android Studio, from compilers, talking to JetBrains engineers all the time. And we figured out a process where we're actually trying not to break you anymore. 
And in fact, um, JetBrains has committed to supporting the last two stable versions of Android Studio whenever they release a new stable version of the Kotlin plugin. So that's great. We're solving some of these early days issues. Uh, we're not breaking you as often <laughs> as we used to, so that's great. But you know, there was a lot more work. Now, the first release of Studio that where we bundled the plugin was 3.0. But not everything was supported there. Like the, the experience when using Kotlin in Android Studio wasn't the same as using the Java programming language. And so over the years, we need to work on things like Linchex. Now, we have a host of new Linchex and analysis tools in Studio that are not there in the base um, IntelliJ IDEA, as well as refactorings that are specific to Android. So we needed to convert all of these to work with Kotlin as well. Um, we have our own project templates where we introduce uh, Kotlin versions of them. And in fact, now that you have this drop-down where you, where you create a new project that says, you know, I want my project in Kotlin or in Java, in fact, now we default to Kotlin. Um, so that every time you create a new project, um, Kotlin is basically preferred. And we also, of course, have samples that you can import into, um, into Android Studio. You can choose to have some of them in Kotlin as well. Now, last year when we released the Android 9 Pi uh, beta SDKs, we started making them Kotlin friendly as well. So, of course, one of the big things about Kotlin is nullability support, right? Right in the language. And um, the Android framework didn't have that. Um, even though the annotations were available in Java, um, we historically didn't have that in the framework. And so we started adding those on uh, many of the function of the methods in, in the Android SDK. And now, if you use the newest um, Android SDKs, you will see that most of the common, commonly used methods actually have nullability support, so you will get proper warnings and errors in, in Kotlin. In fact, these were, er uh, these were warnings um, last year in the Pi SDK just to not break your apps. This year in the Q SDK, we're turning many of them into errors, so you've had one year to actually prepare for this. Um, now, I'm talking about Kotlin friendliness of an SDK, but this also applies to libraries. And if you work on Java libraries and you want to make sure that you're providing a first-class experience for any Kotlin developers that want, want to use your libraries, there's actually a check in Android Studio, um, an inspection that's not enabled by default. Um, so if you go into inspections and if you find the interoperability uh, category under Android Lint, you can en enable that and run the analysis on your library. It'll tell you about all the things you should do to make it um, as good for Kotlin developers as possible. So, you know, making sure that properties work from Kotlin, uh, that you have um, parameters uh, and return values annotated with nullability, uh, that you're not using any Kotlin keywords. I mean, some of the common testing libraries were using um, something like is, you know, keyboards from Kotlin that um, you have to use backticks to actually make them work. So do try it out. And then, oh, going back to this slide, um, so we have content-friendly SDKs. And now, one of the big things that developers always come and tell us at conferences like this, when we talk to them online and so on, is that they really care about build speeds. And we know that introducing Kotlin in your Android project can be detrimental to your build performance. Um, it basically, basically makes in Kotlin and Java makes your build slower. Kotlin is a lot more complicated. It takes a lot more tasks in Android Studio to um, build a Kotlin app. Fortunately, like I said, working with JetBrains has been great, and they're fixing a lot of, all of, uh, a lot of the uh, performance issues in the compiler. We're fixing a lot on our side in the build system to make it work better with Kotlin. And in fact, you know, even the Android Studio team contributes to um, the Kotlin compilers and um, plugins. Um, such as, um, by, uh, in this instance, uh, we just recently contributed a patch that enables incremental compilation for CAPT. Um, this is now out in Kotlin 1.3.30. Uh, you have to enable it with this, um, with this flag. And if you're using something like you know, Dagger, other annotation processors that also have to be um, capable of incremental compilation, uh, try it out. It might make your builds a lot faster. And lastly, I just wanted to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, Kotlin aware optimizations, uh, optimizations in our um, tool chain, so specifically D8 and R8. Uh, these, this is our compiler, our optimizer. And so, you know, other than build performance, of course, as developers, you care about runtime performance. And again, at conferences, sometimes people who are just learning Kotlin or are thinking of introducing Kotlin in their apps, they come to me and ask, will, it, will my app perform as well as if it were written in Java? 
Now, like I said, Kotlin is a little bit more complicated. It offers a lot more stuff than, than just basic Java, um, such as the things we talked about, nullability checks, for example. Um, you use lambdas everywhere. You do functional programming and so on. Um, and so people are afraid if I just start throwing lambdas everywhere, if, I, I, um, if, you know, if um, Kotlin inserts these null checks to every one of my methods, there's a lot more calls to, calls to make. Is that not going to Im impact my app? Well, first of all, um, my answer is, unless you're doing something really crazy in a, in a tight loop where you, know, you execute stuff a thousand times within one, one, um, uh, one let's say, um, frame that it takes to render something on your screen, that y you will not really see a difference. But even, even so, you know, we can do better. And so, like I said, the teams at Google, the engineers working on our compilers and our tool chain, are really committed to making Kotlin work as best on Android as possible. And so here's just an example of an optimization um, that we're doing um, for you if you enable R8 in your apps. Um, so take this, uh, this is pseudo bytecode even. Um, so this is something that um, Kotlin inserts in every one of your methods if you have um, non-null parameters. So it basically, to make sure that it interoperates with Java well, that it crashes if you pass something that's a null when it shouldn't be, it inserts these checks. And so here's a method that has two parameters, a context and a logger. And every time you run this method, what happens is a string is created for the name of the parameter, in this case, context. And then a static method call happens to check if the par par parameter is not null. And so we, you know, it, it's already a cost, creating that string, calling another method, then going into that method, then there's a null check, so it basically checks if a pointer is zero, and then if, if, um, if it is, then it invokes a, another method. And this goes on for every parameter. Now, how can we do better? So what Array can do is actually take out that um, method call that's happening there, inline it into, back into your method, and then invert the condition so that only if you actually pass something null, it jumps to the end of the method and, th and throws. So now, instead of creating strings, calling methods for every parameter, everything that is left for the happy path is just two if equals zero checks. Um, so that's nice. Um, now, for lambdas, we're also doing something clever. Um, now, normally, you know, when you use lambdas, probably you'll have a lot of them. A lot of them, a lot of them will be pretty similar to each other. They will have maybe zero, maybe one parameters. Um, they will have similar captures. And as, as long as the compiler is able to identify lambdas, they're more or less um, equivalent. Uh, it can merge them into a single class instead of having a class for every lambda. So now for n classes and, and, and methods uh, for every lambda, we're down to one class and a simple switch statement. So it switches on an integer, selects the correct lambda implementation, and runs it. Um, so again, less classes, less things in your APK. It's just getting smaller. And by the way, Arrayt is also, of course, a shrinker. So it removes all of the parts of the Kotlin standard library that you're not using. Um, so I hope I convinced you to enable Arrayt in your apps. In fact, Arrayt is now our default shrinker and optimizer as of Android Studio 3.4. So please use it. And if there are any reasons you don't, you're not enabling it in your apps, if there are bugs, if you have any concerns, please let us know on the bug tracker um, on, or come and talk to me. Um, I'll probably be at the Cotton booth, uh, JetBrains booth after the talk. And speaking of R8, um, we're going to talk a little bit about coroutines later. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a sneak peek on, on something I've been working on for the past week. So many of you are probably using coroutines. And many of you are using dispatcher's main to um, run a coroutine back on the main thread. Well, what I'm going to tell you is that most of you are probably making a huge mistake on Android when you use dispatcher's main. And it's not your fault at all. It's just that um, in previous coroutines version, Kotlin X coroutines library um, was implemented in a way that used service loader. It's, it's a standard Java API to load the implementation of dispatcher's main for each platform. The problem was, that service loader on Android is super slow. It needs to open a file from the jar file, read it from, from the storage. In, in doing so, it actually triggers re-verification of the whole um, APK. 
And it can block the main thread, if you call it from the main thread, for up to you know, something like 500 milliseconds for a big APK or even more. And even if you're not calling it from the main thread, if you don't access dispatcher's main from the main thread, you still don't want that kind of delay for any operation in your app. So there were two solutions proposed on the bug that was on GitHub on coroutines. Um, to either re-implement the service loader as something faster, something more optimized for Android, or fix it in R8 um, so that we can, on the Google side, we can fix it in our optimizer whenever we encounter this service loader use on Android. The problem was, um, which solution was chosen? Well, actually both. The problem was that Coroutine, um, Coroutines was um, fixed to now use something called Fast Service Loader, uh, which is a better implementation of Service Loader. It's faster on Android, but it still blocks on disk, on, on storage reads. So even if uh, you know, it's now on the order of tens of milliseconds instead of 500, it still reads from disk, and you don't want to do that on, on the main thread, or you'll cause strict mode violations. The problem was, in R8, we made the optimizations for ser service loader, not fast service loader. So now we went two different directions, right? Fortunately, like I said, working with JetBrains is great, and we're talking, so um, we are fixing it. Um, so just last week, I submitted a patch to Coroutines to actually make it um, so that we can optimize the service loader, um, again, not, not the fast service loader. Um, it's actually been released yesterday as, as a milestone release of 1.3.0 of Coroutines. The other thing you need is to upgrade to a new R8 version. So if you're on Android Studio 3.5, which is currently in beta, you have the new R8 version. And the last thing you need to do, and this is a manual step, so um, remember, if there's one thing you want to take out from this presentation, remember this. This is something you need to do if you're using Dispatcher's main. You need to add this to your R8 config. And that way, the fast service loader will go away completely. It will not even be, be included in your APK. And the service loader will be optimized away by R8. And there will be no disk reads. There will be no blocking. and um, even, it even gets rid of the reflection that's used um, by default. So you, basically, you get direct um, object instantiation. Now, why, why I say this is the almost final solution is because it still has this manual step of adding this to your R8 config. Now, we would have added it to Coroutines, um, but this would, break, uh, this would break everyone on earlier versions of Android Studio. So we just have to wait for a new API in either the Android Gradle plugin or in R8 to be able to ship these custom rules for libraries like Coroutines. So that might come in a future version where, where you will not have to do anything. You will get all of that for free. But for now, do remember this. And another reason to use R8 again. OK, so this was a part about tools. But you know, introducing a new language, like I said, is a big task. It's not only about giving you the tools, and that's it. Go use it. There's actually you know, many other teams, like my team, Android Developer Relations, who come and talk to you at conferences like this. We are the ones who make samples, who create documentation for Android, that needed to learn Kotlin as well. Now, myself, when we were announcing that we support Kotlin, at the time, if I remember correctly, I even had trouble reading Kotlin code. I never used it. We were using Java. This was the only way to make Android apps. Um, and suddenly, I'm faced with you know, not only having to learn a new language, but then going and talking to you guys about it, you folks. And actually, it's been a great journey. Um, we as a team started, just as probably like everyone, we started using uh, learning through Kotlin Cons. We started writing samples, writing code. Um, so in fact, we learned as we went writing our samples doing code reviews for each other. Um, and with time, we actually, you know, we were actually convinced that this is the right way, uh, the right direction for Android to go. Um, and here we are, two years later. Most of our samples are written in Kotlin. I'm here at a Kotlin conference talking to you about, you know, Android going Kotlin first. It's been a great journey, but there was a lot to do. So it's not just about samples. You know, we've had 10 years of Android documentation on our website um, that had to be made somehow Kotlin compatible. Now, first of all, um, if, you, if, you, if you're maybe not an Android developer, if you were trying to get into it, or maybe 
maybe you're even a um, um, Kotlin newbie. Maybe you, you're not even a Kotlin expert yet. Now on developer.android.com slash Kotlin, we've added um, new pages for developers of uh, you know, all kinds of experience. If you want to get into Android, if you want to get into Kotlin, we're showing some common patterns that you can use with Kotlin and Android. Um, but also, even we're trying to help um, teams with something like the adopting Kotlin for large teams. We ba basically want to help developers convince their management, their teammates, um, their team leads um, on how to introduce Kotlin into an existing code base, into your company. You know, even when we announced Kotlin as um, supported on Android, many companies weren't really confident that we're going to support it, that it's not going away, uh, that it's not just a fad. Um, I hope that with everything that we're doing, um, that we've, we're investing in the tool chain, in our outreach and so on, we can help you convince uh, the decision makers in your companies as well to let you use Kotlin um, and basically be happier developers. Um, okay, but back to uh, other things that we did with documentation. So other than just basically having these guides for you to make it easier to get into Kotlin, uh, like I said, we have, we've had a ton of um, text, code snippets there, everything talking about um, the Java programming language on Android. Um, so some time ago, we actually introduced this language switcher so that, that every time you are checking out a new API on Android, every time you want to look at some reference code, uh, you can now select um, Kotlin, view everything that we have there in Kotlin. Um, even more, this I.O. just a month ago, we actually released a language switcher on the reference doc. So even though our platform is still written in Java, nothing's changed there, you can have a Kotlin view on you know, the method names, parameters. You can now see the nullability. Again, um, this benefits from the Kotlin-friendly SDK that we released. Um, so you can basically have a Kotlin view, a Kotlin syntax um, version of our, all our APIs. Now, this works for the framework and for Android X for now. Uh, we want to enable it for other uh, libraries as well in the future. And of course, then there's developer outreach. Uh, so this is everything from trainings, going to conferences, all the articles that my team writes, um, and we put it online. And we've actually recently released a new one. So developing Android apps with Kotlin is a whole beginner course for Android developers, all written in Kotlin, showing Kotlin best practices. So if you, if you know anyone who wants to get into programming, who wants to get into mobile apps, um, I recommend this course. Uh, it's free. It's made by uh, Google engineers. And we also have another one that's been there for a while. It's called uh, Bootcamp for uh, Programmers. It's not an Android-specific course. It's basically, um, it tries to teach Kotlin to people who know other programming languages. And then um, we have, of course, our Medium account, um, Android developers on Medium. Um, if you're maybe just starting to learn about coroutines, or even if you just want to learn some best practices and how we think on, of, about coroutines on Android, uh, recently we posted, um, uh, so far, a three-part series. There's probably going to be more uh, from my colleague, Sean. Uh, it's a great intro to using coroutines on Android and, and to understand how we think about that. So check it out. And lastly, I wanted to call out um, something I've been working on with, uh, with Florina from my team. Um, it's, it's, it's an initiative, a campaign, we're calling Kotlin Everywhere. In fact, this conference, uh, Kotliners, has been one of our first partners. Um, Kotlin Everywhere is, is a name for a program where we're trying to empower local communities to teach Kotlin, um, not just on Android, but on multiple platforms, on, on the backend, on web, uh, on iOS even, to developers all around the world. Um, we want to support the communities. We want to speak at some of those events. We want to um, uh, give you a, basically a toolkit to build your own events. If you're maybe, uh, if you're, some of you are going back to your cities, to your countries, if you have a local community, uh, please check in with them. If you want to help organize something, if you want to maybe speak at their event, there's a lot of people who um, actually haven't even started learning about Kotlin around the world. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for them um, to be able to learn from experts, to learn from you, um, from local companies who work on Kotlin. So do check it out. 
And of course, it would be nothing if I was here on stage telling you, hey, you external developers, go use Kotlin. It's amazing, but there wasn't anything to inside Google to back it up. And actually, um, it, it's been an even more difficult journey for us to enable internal teams to use Kotlin in our apps just because of how huge the general Google code base is. And it uses entirely different tools than what you have at your disposal. Um, however, we did go through that effort. We wanted to enable internal teams to be able to use the same amazing language as you folks. And so, in fact, we're seeing that already a few of the apps you're using are shipping uh, Kotlin code in production, and there's a lot more coming. So if you're still wondering, is this something Google is just going to drop after two years? N no, it's not. We're actually really committed to um, making sure that Kotlin works for everyone. In fact, Kotlin adoption has been on the rise tremendously um, among Android developers since we announced um, Kotlin as supported two years ago. Um, right now, I think this is data from April 2019, around 44% of top 1,000 Android apps use Kotlin already. So again, it's not going away. No way that's going to happen. So we talked a little bit about um, you know, what we've been doing for the past two years. Uh, maybe some of that was known to you. Hopefully, maybe you learned something about our rate, and you will enable it in your apps. Uh, but then there's a lot that we actually were working on and announced at I.O. at that we're hoping will really transform how you make Android apps. So I mentioned this Kotlin first thing, right? So what does it really mean that we're going Kotlin first with Android development? Now, there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet, and it's Android KTX. Um, we released it a, a long time ago, sometime after we announced Kotlin as supported language. This was a really simple set of extensions for Android APIs that make them easier to use from Kotlin, make them uh, the calls to our APIs more idiomatic. Now, of course, uh, because we couldn't change the actual uh, framework APIs, we couldn't change the parameters, their order, or make them use lambdas and so on. But we could fix that with extensions um, that are shipped as a separate library. The thing, is, the thing is about these early KTX extensions was all they were really was syntactic sugar. You didn't get any new functionality. You, didn't, you couldn't do anything that you couldn't do with just the regular Java APIs that we had in, in Android. It was just syntactic sugar. So how does going Kotlin first change that? Now, for the first time, we're seeing that in Android Jetpack, our unbundled libraries, not only we're, for, um, in the first place, making sure that whatever API we make, since they're still mostly written in Java, that we make them Kotlin friendly, that we remember about you know, nullability annotations, that we remember about putting um, parameters that accept functions as last so you can use something like lambdas, um, but we're also releasing all kinds of new integrations, new support for Kotlin features inside Jetpack. So the difference being, it's not just syntactic sugar. These are actually things you couldn't do um, with, Java, with the Java programming language if you use Jetpack. Now, the first example is Room, um, our database uh, library uh, for Android. Now, it, you know, it offers you to do queries on your database, in, an, in a really nice manner. Um, and previously, it had support for returning values uh, um, in, in various ways, such as you know, live data or maybe Rx. Um, recently, in alpha versions, we added uh, suspend function support. So now, instead of dealing with all these old APIs, you simply add the suspend keyword to your database access function. And suddenly, it's safe to call from, you know, from a coroutine started from the main thread because it's, it's main safe. Um, with Work Manager, for example, we're, we're also adding a coroutine integration. Now, Work Manager is a library that enables you to do uh, periodic or a periodic or one-off tasks um, that uh, can happen in, um, you know, they don't have they don't have to run immediately. Um, they can happen sometime in the future. And the way you implement it is you use a worker. The thing is that worker can be canceled at any time by the system. Um, if, it, if the system decides that the work manager can no longer run your app. Now, what the coroutine worker gives you um, is basically you implement your worker as a coroutine, as a sup suspend function, and you get cancellation for free. You don't, you don't have to code it specifically um, in a cooperative manner to be able to be canceled by the system. 
you just rely on the coroutines um, uh, cancellation to do that for you. Now we have special coroutine scope for life cycles and view models. Uh, probably view models is something you'll use more often. Now view model, if you're not an Android programmer, it's, it's, it's a Jetpack library. Um, um, it, it's not a view model that you know from, you know, um, like the architecture, ar architectural view model. It's just a class that's named view model in, in, in our libraries. And it now makes it super easy uh, to adhere to the, um, the way concurrency works with, uh, with coroutines, where you know, every coroutine has to be in a scope um, so that it's canceled properly, that, so that you don't leak it. So now we actually offer an extension on, on every view model. It's a view model um, scope where you can run your coroutines. Whenever the user navigates away from your app, from your view, um, the view model gets destroyed. Uh, all your coroutines get canceled. You don't leak any resources, any work. You don't take up the CPU or network connections unnecessarily. Um, now for live data, um, live data has been a lightweight uh, way of passing data from other threads back to the main thread, showing them in the UI. Um, many people thought ab about it as something like a replacement for streams or something like that. It, it's really a data holder that's, that provides an easy way to kind of bring da data to the, um, to the main thread, put it in the view. Um, but maybe people said they want more. They want it to make it easier to use live data with other things like coroutines, for example. And now we have this coroutine builder that actually lets you um, build a, a, a kind of a live data producer function that runs the coroutine scope and then emits data back to the, uh, back to the live data. Um, and finally, we of course, um, so these are the things that you couldn't just program in Java and edit to Jetpack. These are all things that require features that are um, only possible in the Kotlin programming language. And of course, uh, we're going to continue adding more extensions, more syntactic sugar as well, um, to things like navigation, to basically to every um, Jetpack component and other libraries that we have, where we identify that it will help you as developers be more productive with Kotlin and our libraries. And I think that's what Kotlin First is really about. For the first time, we're actually thinking about our APIs, our anything we offer to you as developers as you know, Kotlin First, and not just making it um, work for, uh, for Java and that's it. Now, if you want to learn more about each of these things, I just talked about on that slide. Uh, there's obviously no time to show you, show you code snippets for everyone. Um, there's a talk from Google I.O. that I really recommend, Understanding Kotlin Coroutines on Android uh, by Heat and uh, Sean. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, one more thing that really connects back to this Kotlin first thing. Uh, this year we announced something called Jetpack Compose. I, I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest things that we announced this I.O., but also the most, um, I would say, low-key announcements, it's, it's, it's not ready yet. It's very experimental. It's a new unbundled UI library. Um, and what's very special about it is, again, this will only be available if you use Kotlin, really, because the other part of that library is a custom Kotlin compiler plugin that enables all kinds of magic to happen here in your app and enables basically a whole new way to write layouts and views uh, for your applications. Instead of traditionally having XML files um, and then um, inflating the view, finding the views, putting data in it, um, in short, in one slide, and that doesn't give it justice at all, Jetpack Compose will let you write these composable functions. You give them some data, they emit parts of your layout, and then the compiler and the runtime do some crazy magic to make sure that it's displayed correctly, that it, um, and updates as your data updates. Now, I specifically don't want to get into that too much. Um, it's too com way too complicated for just um, the end of this keynote um, and the few minutes that I have. So I really recommend you watch declarative UI patterns if you want to learn more. And again, I just want to say we're making this available as very, very experimental. It's not even developer preview. It's not, not even alpha quality. You can start learning about it um, but expect to hear more only in the coming uh, months. Uh, so what's next other than Jetpack Compose? Um, I just wanted to list a few things that we as Google, me personally, that we're super excited about and interested in, in um, what's coming in Kotlin. 
Uh, of course, like I said, we love coroutines. We think it's probably the best way right now to do async operations on Android. And so we're going to be looking into exploring more ways we can um, enable coroutines for um, on Android libraries and Android usage. Um, of course, there's a lot of people. It's, it's a fairly new concept, especially if you're coming from Java where this didn't, didn't exist. So we, of course, need to invest uh, in training as well so that everyone feels comfortable using coroutines uh, if they want to. And we're also watching new language features and new libraries that are coming out. Um, one of them, um, I saw Flow, for example. I haven't used Flow myself yet, but it's definitely something we're looking at. Um, so, you know, whatever happens with Kotlin Next, you can be sure that we're following it closely, and then we'll decide if it's something good to adopt on Android, if it'll work well for our use cases, our applications. And if yes, then we'll be here to provide you guidance and support on how to use it. Um, Interesting thing is also we're watching the library ecosystem. So not just our libraries, but we're seeing other libraries on the on the market adopt Kotlin um, very heavily, actually. Um, uh, in fact, I just saw Retrofit was released with suspend function support as well. So you know it's not only us making our uh, libraries work best with Kotlin. Um, many developers are actually um, thinking the same. Uh, Kotlin is the future um, for apps on Android. And now there might be questions about multi-platform and Kotlin native. I haven't really covered it in my presentation. Uh, but yes, it's something I am personally super excited about. Um, I did presentations about this on, uh, at other conferences. Uh, I'm exploring the topic myself. Now, I've never written an iOS app before. And when I started preparing for a Kotlin native talk, um, I basically ported my sample Android app to iOS within one week without knowing any iOS. Um, by sharing basically all of the lower layers of my app application stack, um, you know, the business logic, persistence, and so on, uh, using a multi-platform project um, and Kotlin native on iOS. Um, so I think it's a great, great way for sharing code between platforms. The reason why we're not talking about it um, yet in our documentation, our guidance, is because Kotlin native is still in beta. Um, the tools, the compilers have to still, the libraries especially, uh, still have to come a long way until they'll be ready uh, for us to recommend. But it's definitely something uh, that I think um, is, is super exciting and, and something to watch for the future. Um, and of course, we're going to be continuing. Uh, all of what we're doing is really about developer experience. So if you find anything that's really broken that you really wish that we did but we are not doing yet, uh, please come and find me uh, and tell me. Because we're really interested in what you think is still missing for Kotlin on Android. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. I don't know if we have a few minutes for questions. You can also find me afterwards in the booth. Thanks. Thank you.